my thanks to the conference organizers. Uh, my thanks to all of you for coming to listen. Uh, I'd like to mention my collaborators, Jeff Bond and Alex Skolnick, and also I'd like to mention that Alex will be continuing the uh, talk that I'm going to begin in the next half hour. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank um, Dasheng for a really beautiful talk, uh, for introducing uh, a number of ideas that I'm going to be working with. So this is, uh, this is fantastic uh, that when I get to them, we're having them for the second time. And also um, to say that I've been following uh, this work on approximate factor models and sparse PCA for a couple of years now. I actually learned about it from Marcus Pelger, who is a graduate student here. He's now an assistant professor at Stanford. And he also works with high frequency data and these types of models. And, and the, uh, the subject is, is uh, really quite, quite wonderful. Um, uh, and finally, uh, thanks to the previous speaker for mentioning my former employer, MSCI Barra. I worked there for 19 years, uh, uh, through ending in 2012. And I think at least one of my former colleagues is here in the audience today. So, so that's really great. Uh, but to begin, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back, so this is all going to be familiar uh, based on what you've just heard, to a slightly simpler problem. Uh, I'm going to assume, uh, as um, many do, that uh, security returns follow a factor model. So for me, R is always going to be return, uh, Z is going to be factor exposures, zeta is going to be factor returns, epsilon is going to be specific return. And this is the problem uh, that was preliminary to what was considered in the previous talk, goes back at least as far as Stephen Ross in 1976 and maybe before that uh, to the market model and to work of Bill Sharp in the 1960s. So this formulation has been around for a very long time. Now, what's a factor? For me, in this talk, factors can be broad factors like the market as we heard or Fama French factors and then industries or maybe something else. But for me in this talk and, and probably for Alex in the next talk as well, a factor is going to be anything uh, that, it is not driving uh, that is driving correlation. And what's left over from the factors, these epsilons, are going to be uh, truly diversifiable components of return. So this is the setup. Uh, given uh, those assumptions and given an assumption of specific return being uncorrelated with common factor return, you get a very simple decomposition of the covariance matrix into L for low rank and delta for diagonal. This is from way back in time, uh, 1976. Now, why do we care about this? Well, for a pers from the perspective of a practitioner, a practitioner wants to understand what component of return can be diversified away. That's a very important thing to know if you're investing. So even if statistical methods and so on don't weed that out for us in a way that is, um, is natural, it's still a very important thing to know. Another thing to keep track of is just from a lot of experience, epsilon we think of, well, it's diversifiable. We think of it as also a small thing, because in mathematics, epsilon is always small. In fact, if you take an individual US stock, roughly half the return is common factor and half the return is epsilon. So it's big. It's big for individual stocks. It's big in concentrated portfolios. Of course, it's diversifiable. So if you look at the market portfolio, it's basically gone. So this is the setup. And because I'm an investor and because I want to be able to forecast risk in a way that I can take care of diversification properly, I'm actually quite interested uh, in this uh, equation. And how, um, how am I going to figure it out? Well, I've got three possible methods here, and I've put one in blue, uh, fundamental analysis. Now, if you think back, say, 10 years ago, when you wanted to um, make a plane reservation, so what did you do? You phoned uh, American Airlines or United Airlines and, right, and some agent was there with a bunch of computers and stuff and helped you. And there, were, there, there was a lot of human intervention. And if you ask today, how are the models that we use in investment uh, to manage risk created, they are very heavily rooted in fundamental analysis. Now, this doesn't mean we don't use a lot of statistics and a lot of mathematics and all kinds of quantitative techniques. But if I want to know what a factor is, Someone thinks of it, the market, right? We all think of the same things, right? Interest rates, I'll list a bunch of factors in a while. Fundamental analysts tell us what the factors are. 
and this is pervasive throughout financial services. I work with a group, uh, Perio, uh, we manage money uh, out of Sausalito. I was using these models this very morning in quantitative methods, but still fundamental models uh, to map. Uh, this, this is what's out there. So if the word entrenched comes to mind, there's, there's a good reason for it. Now, statistical methods, uh, I should say these BARA models go back to the 1970s when Barr Rosenberg began BARA. Um, BARA uh, is BARA and Associates. And some of BARA's old papers uh, were actually quite innovative in their time and, and are very beautiful. And if you'd like, I'd be happy to send out information about how this remarkable company did come into being and what were the ideas that were cutting edge so many years ago. Uh, just as old is the statistical analysis that we were hearing about in the last talk. Ross's paper, which corresponds to the formulation I had on the previous slide, it's 1976. Very quickly, we moved to approximate factor models, a more complex structure on the epsilons, I think with a paper by Rothschild and Chamberlain in 1983. Uh, and then through there, there's been a huge and complex and beautiful development of PCA and culminating in some of the wonderful things we were just hearing about. This has been, I would say, from a practitioner's point of view, a very academic exercise. Not that there aren't people on Wall Street using principal components, of course they are all over the place, but it is not the dominant way that risk is managed or that factor models are put together, at least as far as I can tell. So then there's the third thing, uh, the new kid on the block, it's red because it's the thing I'm going to want to talk about. It's also a statistical method, uh, uses computer science, uses low rank plus uh, sparse methods. I'm told, I, I'm very sorry I wasn't here for some of the afternoon talks yesterday that these were were mentioned, and so perhaps those of you who are here uh, have been hearing about them already in this uh, con uh, conference. And so this is also statistical. It's very different. Uh, statistical methods PCA and statistical methods convex optimization. I don't know, electric cars and combustion engines, you can both drive, drive around in both kinds of cars. They get you somewhere, but what's going on under the hood is very different. So uh, we're going to be talking here about a slightly different way of using uh, mathematics, algorithms, computer science uh, to get at what are factors through convex optimization. We're going to get a low rank piece uh, plus a sparse piece plus, and there's going to be diagonal. Uh, we're going to be disentangling uh, factors. Okay, so what are the practical considerations? Uh, in the previous talk, there was this fantastic picture of intraday volatility. Uh, I was actually a little surprised not to see the flash crash, which is one of my favorite examples of that. Just some huge um, type, uh, a huge drawdown in the middle of a day, bounced right back. And in a certain sense, um, for some investors, it was very good to be there with that. For others, uh, many were said, thank God I was on the golf course, right? I missed that whole thing. So when you're talking about volatility, uh, it's important to think about what horizon you're looking out on. There's high frequency fluctuations, there's daily fluctuations. So data frequency, I'm down at the bottom of the slide, is an important consideration. High frequency data is not universally available, uh, even in the cases that you would like to have it. Uh, so consider uh, investors in global equities, right, uh, or emerging markets, or in uh, private equity, where you get the quarterly lag data as opposed to even the daily data. So data frequency is certainly a practical consideration when we build these types of models. High frequency data, that's where the smart money is, I guess. It's very interesting, but it is quite narrowly focused in a few uh, equity markets. Um, going back up to the top, one of the reasons why it's hard to get your hands around all these risk factors is because they have personalities. So uh, Sheng mentioned some of them, of course, the broad dominant market factor, which is not just something that affects every asset or most every asset, which it does. Uh, it affects it in a positive way, right? If, I don't know if you guys manage money, but if you do manage money and you're paying attention, you may notice that when the market's up, your portfolio generally is too, right? Most assets are positively exposed to the market. So it's both a broad factor and a predominantly positive factor. Other broad factors you were hearing about, equity styles like momentum or value or size or these things. These are broad factors in an equity context or maybe not so much in multi-asset class where they become 
narrower factors. Uh, credit worthiness is a consideration. Interest rates uh, for certain securities. Um, prepayment risk if you've got mortgages in there. There's lots and lots of factors that can be brought in one context or narrow in another. Uh, factors that are narrow in most contexts, country, uh, we heard about industries. These are the same things as gig sectors, exposure to certain currencies. Uh, these are um, a type of factor. There's also emerging factors. The reason we want to do a PCA or a convex optimization, low rank sparse at all, because the structure of these fundamental analysis uh, models are fixed until an analysis changes it, whereas a um, statistical model is dynamic. It can evolve on its own. It can change uh, over time. Now, there's a bullet point at the bottom here, which I think is a, an argument for some of the things that I'm going to show you, emerging structure on different scales. If you think of emerging narrow factors, uh, like uh, or emerging broad factors, maybe cl climate sensitivity or uh, some new industry coming out. The internet was a big problem back early in the 2000s. You can think of what is the size of the cohort that's going to be exposed to that factor. And in designing algorithms that go after these factors, they're going to have to be sensitive to what it is they're looking for. Um, so eigenvalues come up a lot in PCA. They're going to be less important in uh, less directly important than what I'm going to talk about. So to get uh, at all of these factors with all these uh, different personalities, instead of uh, going to high frequency data, which works sometimes and not others, uh, we're going to take our original factor model, uh, where I've got all the factors in the Zs and the epsilons are left over. I'm going to split that Z into two parts. Uh, this is just getting started at capturing some personalities. The Y and the Psi are going to be the exposures of and returns to broad factors. The x and the phi are going to be the exposures of and returns to narrow factors. And the epsilon is just the same it was above. So I've got a three-term decomposition. Uh, I've got a capital K, which I'm going to use for my number of broad factors. I'm going to use the Greek kappa for the number of narrow factors. Think countries or industries. Uh, and then uh, the epsilons are going to be left over. Now, at the bottom, we have some model assumptions. Uh, K is much smaller than N, the number of securities, uh, as is kappa. Uh, and we're going to um, be assuming X is sparse. This comes from our friends, the fundamental analysts, who have been telling us what these factor models look like since the 1970s. And so we're going to take them and see if we can do, uh, do analysis that captures these stylized things that we're learning about. Hopefully, it'll be able to go beyond that as well. Okay, so I've got a fancier return matrix, uh, return generating process. I get a fancier return covariance matrix. It's sigma, it's got three parts. It's got a broad component, L sub K. It's going to, K is going to be the rank of that, number of broad factors. Uh, kappa, L kappa is going to be the narrow factor component. Delta is definitely diagonal. That's what my investors want to know. They can diversify away. And we see we can group these uh, like orig Ross's original uh, L plus delta, and that's what a Barra model looks like. Or we can group them as LK, the broad factors, plus S, and that's a little bit what these sparse PCA methods look like. So we can take either orientation. And then the stuff at the bottom uh, is just uh, what I've been uh, saying with the exposures and so on and how all of this lines up to give you uh, the pieces. It's the exposures times the factor covariance matrix times the exposures transpose, both for the low rank piece and the sparse piece. And this will be uh, familiar, I guess, to anyone who does factor analysis. And, and if not, um, certainly happy to go through the details. So. Uh, we get a refined recovery problem. Instead of trying to do uh, the Barra model, uh, which is going to give you the big low rank and the diagonal, or um, a PC PCA, a kind of an advanced PCA model, which is going to give you the broad factor piece and the sparse, we're just going to try and get all three pieces out of it, L sub K, L sub kappa, and delta. And then these things sum up uh, as we have said. Uh, finally on this slide is performance metrics. So um, we've been 
working on uh, latent factor models for a while, and naturally as an, um, kind of a statistician, uh, I look to see how my parametric fits are. You know, this eigenvector is close to that eigenvector, or this L2 norm. There's lots of norms floating around there, L infinity norms, spectral norms, sparsity norms, nuclear norms. We're going to see plenty of them. And I kind of get to the end of the exercise and go back to my investors and say, see, uh, this norm is small. And they kind of look at me like I've lost my mind. They said, well, what does that do for me? Am I getting the forecast accurate or what? And so one of the exercises we're going to do is talk about some much simpler performance metrics that are very investor focused so that we can see how well we're doing from the point of view of people who want to get accurate risk forecasts in a very direct way and so that this communicates to them. Alex will be talking about this and drawing these metrics back to the more standard uh, statistical me metrics. Uh, so this is um, a little cartoon uh, for what we're going to do. This is back from three months ago, simulated data, uh, where we were dealing with 32 by 32 matrices. I think that was uh, about as high as we could go at the time. Uh, we can go a little bit bigger now. And we took a two broad factor, I think four narrow factor model, and calibrated it uh, as well as we knew how, and simulated, I think, 250 observations and made this sample covariance matrix. And we fed it to uh, a low rank, sparse, diagonal decomposer, and this is what we got out of it. So um, that's the low rank piece up at the right, uh, the low rank broad, it's the low rank narrow, it's the diagonal. Uh, the thing looks very, very smart when you pop these things out. It found the structure. One thing I do want to say is that the sparse component, the, the uh, narrow component doesn't really look like that. I mean, think of a global model, right? Every asset is going to be exposed to at least one industry and one country, probably. So there's that, um, while these factors are narrow, there's really a lot more complexity in that uh, component up there than is suggested by this picture. But uh, hopefully the methods that we're, we're talking about here are going to transcend that and see uh, beyond the fact, uh, b beyond what, what humans are able to to observe. Okay, so uh, I will not spend a lot of time on this slide because it actually repeats many things that uh, I said before, but I do want to announce that theta for me is an indication of the convex program or PCA or fun fundamental analyst or other gadget that I'm going to use to pop out those estimators. L sub k, L sub kappa, and delta k, and we're just get, uh, uh, and uh, delta, and we're just going to keep track uh, of the gadget with theta. In low rank sparse decompositions, there's going to be tuning parameters. I'm going to show you what they are. Uh, in PCA, there's, there's all kinds of PCA stuff. And there will be some comparison to a classical PCA, which is far less sophisticated than what you've just seen in the previous talk. In a certain sense, it's a straw competitor for our model, but in another sense it's not, because there are at least three commercial providers who are trying to build statistical models, and guess what they're doing? They're using classical PCA, but I will not name those um, providers uh, during this talk. Okay, so here's uh, what we did. Uh, this is probably the most dense mathematical slide. So there is a two-step program, and this is just one way to look at it. We can uh, take lots of techniques out of uh, convex optimization theory and use them in different orders. And it may indeed be that depending on the context, we're going to have to use different combinations of these things. So uh, right now, and we may have to modify them. These are fairly um, standard ones. Uh, if you're in the subject, we didn't invent either one of them. The first one, CPW, Chandrasekharan, Perillo, and Wilski, three guys out of MIT. Uh, and then the second one has a, a fourth author, Saunderson, who is, I think, at, at Caltech. Is that Saunders, Washington. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so we're going to use two convex programs to do the example that I'm going to show in a minute. And the first one is going to um, have two terms. The first term is a norm on L, uh, a low rank part, and a norm on S, the sparse part. And there's a little tuning parameter, gamma multiplied times the sparse part. Lambda weights that whole term, and then I'm going to subtract something, and what I'm going to subtract is a Gaussian likelihood based on the data. And you can think a lot of things uh, you want to about Gaussian likelihoods. From the purpose here, one perspective on it 
is that it's just tying the estimation, estimator to the data. I mean, what's the job of this thing? It's to take a sample covariance matrix, look at it, decide immediately what the noise is, throw it out, and do a perfect decomposition into an S and an L. Okay, so that's the job of that thing. So there's, uh, just to say what these norms are, the norm on the L is a nuclear norm. That's uh, the trace of the matrix or the sum of the eigenvalues, and it is a convex relaxation of rank. Okay? The norm on the S is a sparse, uh, a sparse norm, uh, just the standard L1 norm, and gamma is the trade-off between how much weight I'm putting on one term and how much on the other. The lambda is a parameter that tunes uh, to tell you how much weight to put on the structure, that's the low rank plus sparse part, and how much weight to put on the data. That's, um, we're tying here to data with a Gaussian likelihood. And then we subject ourselves to a positive definite constraint, which is what's underneath the min. So um, an important thing to notice here is the curly nature of the L's and the S's. So in fact, the natural thing to do here is to decompose the concentration matrix, not the covariance matrix, even though the structure we wanted is on the covariance matrix. There's um, quite a bit of discussion about this. There's algorithms that do one, there's algorithms that do the other. One nice thing to know is that if you decompose the concentration matrix into a low rank and a sparse, then you also have a decomposition of the covariance matrix into a low rank plus a something. And if your sparse thing in one case is block diagonal, then it's block diagonal in the other. Uh, sparsity isn't preserved under this inversion process, but, but a lot of important properties are. So there's always sparsity floating around somewhere. This decomposition is on the concentration matrix. We flip the thing using the Woodbury identity, or some um, would be a way to do this, to get an L and an S of the covariance matrix. Then we take the S and apply MTFA, the Saunderson paper, to do the second optimization problem where we minimize the nuclear norm subject to uh, the S, the sparse piece, being the sum of a, uh, another low rank matrix, but this one's got a higher dimension, kappa, and a diagonal. And this thing returns three matrices, which sum up to the right thing if we've done, done this correctly. So here's a little empirical study, uh, which is, I'm, see, I'm probably Oh, this is almost out of time. So we'll just show you one picture before I hand off to Alex. We took uh, State Street, um, was kind enough to give us returns to 25,000 global equities. We grabbed 500 of them uh, belonging to kappa equals uh, the square root of n uh, countries, which is, I guess, 20-something here. We have no idea how many broad factors there are. We used a year's worth of daily data. So this is very much a poor man's experience from the perspective of a high frequency guy, but if you're trying to do a global model or trying to build out into uh, other asset classes, it's certainly the best you're ever gonna do. And in any case, it is a worthy problem on its own, all of these problems, estimating at different frequency, using low, high frequency data to tell you about low frequency, all of that stuff, all very good. Um, we set the gamma parameter, um, by the way, this, this theory has its roots in a lot of papers. All of them have Emmanuel Candace's name on them. I hope to meet him someday. I haven't done that yet. And uh, this rela relates to a lot of wonderful uh, literature about face recognition and uh, a lot of other stuff that you can do. Uh, lambda, we play around with. We left gamma fixed uh, for the experiment that I'm gonna show you. Now this was, the in this was related to the input data. We input a covariance matrix. In fact, we could have input a correlation matrix, but we didn't do it. Uh, but we're showing you the correlation matrix so you get a beautiful looking picture because when you take empirical data, sometimes the outliers dominate the scale and it's hard to see what's going on. So this is the correlation matrix underlying what we input into the algorithm. This is what we fed it. You can see all those country blocks Right there on the diagonal, uh, we sampled out of, out of 20 something countries, 500 securities. And you can also see there's a lot of other stuff that you want to get industry effects and other, all kinds of effects in there. Uh, this is the low rank recovery where uh, we ended up with K for the theta that we chose to be 25 um, broad factors. That's kind of big. I think in a, a standard uh, BARA model, you'll get more like you know, 15 broad factors in a global equity model, and then you'll get, you know, another 80 or 90 um, narrow factors. So this is a little bit high. 
um, but it's an interesting picture. Here is, um, this, so th this picture, I'm not going to show you all three. This is the sum of the last two, so it's a little bit more analogous to the previous talk. This is the recovery of the correlation matrix plus the diagonal, uh, which we see these blocks corresponding to countries popping out. And there is um, a special reason why I wanted to show you this sum. And this is one of the things, talking about under the hood, the way your electric car works differently from your combustion engine. Um, this is a picture of the spectra of the two components. So the blue was the low rank, and the green is the sparse, which is the sum of the narrow uh, low rank and the diagonal. And I want you to notice how those things are intertwined. In other words, one of the things this algorithm is not doing is picking factors by having big eigenvalues. It has, uses eigenvalues for sure. It has other um, criteria, though, for deciding when something is a factor than separating spectres. So it's working in a fundamentally different way. So uh, it has become my um, day job, hobby, and actually favorite activity to stare at the way eigenvalues of these components sum together in these decompositions, which I'm completely fascinated by but I only brought one picture. Um, so in order to stay on time, we can end right here. And I just want to say something that uh, I used to say at BARA all the time, which is that security return covariance matrices are one of the most fundamental elements of managing financial risk, of um, optimizing portfolios. But practical considerations have complicated the process of using um, completely quantitative methods to get at what the the factors are. And to date, the recovery has relied more maybe than it needs to in the long term on human beings. Not that I want to put people out of job, but we we'll just take all those people, retrain them to be doing these low rank sparse decompositions. They'll probably have a, a good time learning that, right? So um, initial experiments, I just showed a tiny one here, uh, suggest that this technology uh, has a lot of potential. Uh, and importantly, this technology, even though it may give you pictures that look kind of similar to stuff that come out of sparse PCA, it's doing something that is profoundly different in its core. And given the complexity of the problem, I would not be surprised at all if it takes a combination of the fundamental analysts and the sparse PCA guys and this type of technology to get a fully automated, usable solution to this problem. Okay, so uh, Alex, you're up. <laughs>